Sure. Thank you, David. Wonderful to be back here. Uh, I'm, by the way, I'm wearing my T-shirt, which says Harvard, because not everyone can get into Colgate. <laughs> okay. Um, I have given a couple of craft talks that actually were craft talks in the past, but um, how we approach our craft really you know, derives from, it's not just something you learn in a class, it derives from and, uh, and uh, reflects our lives. So that I thought this time I would just read some excerpts uh, from an autobiography I was asked to write for the Gale uh, year, literary biography yearbook or something like that uh, about uh, how I began as a writer, and I hope that at least here and there it will touch on some of your feelings or concerns. I titled it, Why I Am Not Driven. <clears throat> when I start to talk about my parents and their lives as string quartet violinist, which I do whenever I'm asked about my life as a writer, because music and my parents' devotion to it were there from the beginning for me, were what I was born into, Listeners are apt to say, now we understand why you're so driven. They will sometimes offer up the thought that I see my work as a way to earn my parents' approval, that I hope by meeting the standards for art set by my parents to earn their love. This is why I'm a, I am a perfectionist. They will, and they have, told me. I don't argue with them, in part because people rarely want to know more about you than they already do, and in part because the truth involves feelings I have wanted to protect, out of guilt or fear of embarrassing myself or maybe simply a fear of being wrong. I could be wrong, but I do not believe that I am driven. I do not believe I write hoping to win my now deceased parents' love, attention, praise, approval. I believe that if I had wanted to win my late parents' love, attention, praise, approval, I would have said yes to the boy who asked me to the senior prom. <laughs> and I wish I had. <laughs> I would have gone through sorority rush, and I wish I had. I would have learned to dance, and I wish, wish, wish I had. It's a great lack in my life is not being able to, to dance. I would have learned to cook and garden and play poker. I would have done those things and others like them, because although my parents would not tolerate the almost, the cheap, the untested, the unnecessary in their art, they were not ogres. And when they said that all they wanted from us, the children, was for us to be happy, they meant it. But you see, I had already given my heart to that music I heard while I was still in the womb. I would have heard it anyway, it was what their days were made of, but my mother had read that babies in the womb are influenced by what they hear. And as if rehearsals and practice sessions and concerts were not enough, she played recordings all through the Louisiana spring and summer and autumn to make damn sure that I heard it. The most beautiful music there is, a music made equally of logic and feeling. Thus, long before Siegfried Othmer stopped me just as I was getting on the school bus to go home and asked me if I would be his date for the prom, and I said no, but only because I was too stupid and too groggy to tell him this, I had been up all night the night before reading or studying or writing. I had promised myself to another life. I had come into the world pinned, pledged, and preoccupied preoccupied by a revelation I felt had been vouchsafed me and by a corollary recognition that my task was to help others see what had been revealed to me. I was born a lover and evangelist like all disciples. I did not feel driven. I felt called. I used to think I was special, even weird in this regard, but now I suspect many, if not most writers, feel the same way. Writer's art is, by the nature of its medium, an art that both shows and tells, creates 
and seeks to understand. When I was young, I thought of myself as having been given a mission. That is the word I used, but only silently to myself, because it would have been presumptuous, if not just plain foolhardy, to say it aloud. Maybe my mission was nothing more than a fantasy. There was not a lot of evidence that I would ever fulfill it. I wasn't, at least not often, one of those children who write stories at the age of eight or publish sonnets at 12, and for years I simply listened to music, read, daydreamed, and tried to copy Kim Novak's haircut. <laughs> <clears throat> we left Baton Rouge when I was four, moving into the tenement apartment in Ithaca, New York, that would be our home for five years. Our parents were desperately busy and desperately poor in wartime, in, wartime, in a cold gray town populated by Yankees. It wore my mother down. Finally, my parents were able to escape a depressing, exhausting, bare-bones existence, and they escaped to Richmond, Virginia. All that time, nobody bothered me much. I guess a little. There were a couple of brouhaha's involving conflicts with parents about vocational goals. First, I announced I was quitting the piano in order to become a writer. I was 12. My mother said that she would rather kill me than have me turn out like my big brother, a beatnik. She ran to the kitchen to get the butcher knife. My father grabbed her by the arms and made her drop the knife. Next, I wrote a long poem in rhyming quatrains. It was Shakespeare who had caused me to do this. I was in love with the singing line, the felt idea, a rampaging world controlled by structure, the fantastic as a mirror of reality. The teacher gave my poem a C. When she handed it back to me, I cried and couldn't stop crying, but my grade stayed a C. She said she was grading in relation to what you are capable of, but I had done the best I could do. I knew I couldn't write any better than that. The following year, I submitted a story to my high school literary magazine. It was a story about a man, a failed writer, who was thinking of killing himself, quite likely with a butcher knife. <laughs> As he walked along the street, deep in despair, he passed a conservatory. From one of the windows came the sounds of a pianist practicing Beethoven's Wallstein Sonata. Hearing this music, beautiful beyond words, the man resolved to live. The editors of the literary magazine declined to publish my story on the grounds that it was too depressing. I told my guidance counselor, who asked me what my vocational goals were, that I was interested in writing, science, and drama. Well, she said, why don't you write science fiction shows for television? <laughs> When I was writing, late at night, my attic room cool at last, briefly before dawn, I was possibly the happiest person on earth. I copied the final paragraph of Moby Dick into a spiral notebook, feeling the long line of the words play itself out under my hands like the line attached to a harpoon. I pored over the battle scenes in War and Peace, because to me they seemed a part of the book's music. This was the first room I had to myself, and it was magical. There was a wooden seat under the dormer window. My brother did some complicated wiring that allowed me to turn the downstairs dining room radio on and off from upstairs so I could listen to the all-night classical station. I could also stack records on the downstairs player and listen to them on speakers he'd put in my room. I had a closet with a small dresser and mirror at one end and no door, so I could primp in my baby doll pajamas while working on that Kim Novak hairstyle. My mother tried to make peace with me. She asked to see some of my poetry. I showed my mother a poem in which I used the word nipple. She, res she responded by having a mock heart attack. <laughs> None of us knew it was mock, of course. Not even she did. And when the doctor came to our house, black bag in hand, I thought I had killed my mother with my shameless poem. <laughs> you must be careful, she said to me on another occasion, not to have more success than your big brother. He decided to be a writer first, and he's a boy. 
My father took some of my work to one of his colleagues at Richmond Professional Institute. The colleague wrote a letter in which he said I had a flare, F-L-A-R-E, <laughs> for words, but that girls grew out of this kind of thing. Even though I hadn't yet grown out of my wish to write, I had to quit writing, at least for the foreseeable future, in order to study science and mathematics. This was another of the many schemes that were launched on behalf of my future. I would be a pianist, a housewife, an actress, a secretary, a scientist, an Indian chief, a candle maker, anything but a writer. Science was now in the ascendance, and at 17 I was transferring to the New Mexico Institute of Science and Technology for my sophomore year. I made a note to myself about my academic obligation. For the next several years I wrote, I must not write. But when I was kicked out of college for the second time, and no college anywhere would enroll me, I wrote a novella to show everyone I was serious about writing. Luckily, a dean whose own daughter had been kicked out of school was fond of me because I reminded him of her, and he took me under his wing and got me reinstated. That was at Mary Washington College. In my last summer of college, I was making up missed courses. I took on a non-credit course that a sociology professor and I devised. We just sat down together and made it up and didn't even ask whether it could be for credit. Every day we'd meet in the campus soda shop out for hours at a time. Reading for the course kept me up until three or four or five in the morning. One day near the end of summer, I worked up the courage to show him an allegory I had written. For four hours when we met that day, he told me how I had no talent for writing and should stick with my analytic studies. He was diligent and kindly and concerned about me and had, after all, given his entire summer to me and he tried to couch his criticism in gentle terms. When he was finished, I said thank you and left the table. At the top of the steep staircase, I fainted. When I came to, the sociology professor and the school nurse were bending over me. Is it that time of month, dear, asked the nurse, in a whisper that the sociology professor was not supposed to hear, but certainly did. And this is, was how it went for quite a long time. It would be nice to be able to say that I persevered, but sometimes I think the opposite is truer. I quit. I quit again and again, the way a thoroughly addicted smoker will keep quitting. Of course, like the smoker, I returned each time to my addiction. I quit writing when I got married. I quit again when I got divorced. Every day I would tell myself that I had no business writing. It was not what I deserved to be doing. This was indeed a little lecture I honed and delivered myself to myself in the morning before going to work, out loud. Writing was never anything I could say no to. I had better luck quitting smoking. I haven't smoked since the second draft of my first novel. When I write, I am still in my attic room. I am not worried about whether I will have too much success or too little. It does not matter if no one approves of what I am doing. It does not even matter if my mother reading it would want to kill herself. I was shameless then and I am shameless now, the way addicts are. My mother never stood a chance and eventually she gave in and even supported my habit. Writing is a state of being in which the hope of beauty and the quest for truth combine like a mirage, like a dream of natural power but the place you are trying to get to can never quite be gotten to because it is a place that, like great music, is beyond words. Shakespeare, Melville, and Tolstoy are like directions on a map, but not even they are the place itself, which, as Socrates suggested, is where your soul first resided and where you have so inarticulately learned, longed to return ever since you unwittingly left it. It is a place of pure harmony. The thought of reaching it will keep you alive, though also in thrall. It will fill you with the desire to write and write and write stories like sonatas, novels like symphonies, poems like string quartets, the words spilling out of the window into the street for any despairing passerby to hear and be saved by. If your work does not do this, if no one is rescued, the impulse is still there. This is the intention, 
to create art that is irresistible, art that possesses the power to make us human beings, we paradoxical beings who are born haunted by our own skepticism, want to live. I was 20 when I entered the University of Virginia as a graduate student in philosophy. There I met Henry Taylor, a sophomore, and R.H.W. Dillard, a graduate student, both in the English department and both determined to be writers. Henry invited me to a small bootleg seminar run by Fred Bornhauser, a professor of literature, which was, in effect, a non-credit poetry workshop. The next fall, George Garrett arrived to teach an official writing class, the first such class at the University of Virginia, and quickly became the charismatic center and guiding light of our literary activities. Someone at the University of Virginia told me that there were places where you could actually take a degree in writing. There were not many of these programs at that time. I sent for information from the University of Iowa, Stanford University, and the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Catalogs in hand, I realized that Stanford was too far away. I could visualize the other side of the moon, but not California. Iowa required transcripts from every school I had attended, and I assumed they would not be overjoyed to learn that I had transferred six times to five schools, two of which had expelled me. <laughs> and a friend had lent me a copy of, of a book of poems by Robert Watson, who was on the faculty at Greensboro. Here was poetry that dared to rhyme, that dared the dramatic monologue, that, in short, ignored what seemed to have become the conventions of then-current verse and went its own quite jaunty way. I enrolled at Greensboro. It was the perfect place. It was sleepy, out of the mainstream. The teachers were not in the celebrity game, and Fred Chapel, Robert Watson, Alan Tate, Guy Owen, and Peter Taylor conveyed their love of the highest standards. Randall Jarrell was also on the faculty. I audited his class in modern American poetry for three months before his sudden death. Visiting writers included Eudora Welty and Carolyn Kaiser. During my second year there, an anthology called The Girl in the ba Black Raincoat was published. It was an anthology of fiction and poetry edited by George Garrett, and it was inspired by my black raincoat. I had a black raincoat and I wore it everywhere just because I didn't have a long sleeve sweater. <laughs> but um, fantasies were indulged in by some men about perhaps there wasn't anything under the black raincoat. <laughs> Contributors included Annie Dillard, Henry Taylor with the story that had started the whole thing, Leslie Fiedler, Mary Lee Settle, Carolyn Kaiser, and others, Donald Justice and Mark Strand produced a co-authored poem. They'd all had described to them this girl who used to wear a black raincoat even on sunny days. It was the publication parties thrown for the girl in the black raincoat at Hollins College and in Charlottesville that persuaded me I ought to be married. Everyone else, it seemed to me, was. Everyone else had a real life as a real person and not just as a fantasy. Also, everyone else knew enough not to go to a publication party without a poem stuck in her coat pocket. It hadn't even occurred to me that we'd be giving re readings. I now know that wherever writers congregate, be prepared for a reading. I knew the fellow I had been dating, Jonathan, would ask me to marry him if I let him know I was available for marriage. He did, and I said yes. My mother liked Jonathan. She and my father picked us up at the bus station the weekend we went to Richmond for a blood test. Jonathan and I got in the back seat. Would you like a lifesaver, my mother asked him, turning around to offer him the open roll. Too late, he said. <laughs> we divorced in our third year. We were living in New York then, and I took whatever jobs turned up. I was starting a new job on a Monday. I had been asked on the basis of some freelance copy editing I had done to write a teacher's guide to Jewish morality tales. I spent the weekend smoking hash with a male friend. On Monday morning, I called my new boss to tell him I would not be coming in after all because I was thinking of killing myself and would therefore probably not be available for employment. <laughs> Let's have lunch first, he said. 
<laughs> At lunch, he suggested that I write down what had happened on what had turned out to be a really, really bad date. I no longer believed I could write a story. And so I wrote him a long letter, even though I had only just met him. He showed the letter to the writer Abraham Rothberg, now a lifelong mentor and friend, who nudged, coaxed, challenged, and persuaded me to make a story of it by plastering the margins with X's, each indicating a scene in want of development, and by paying no attention at all to my reluctance. Commentary published the story. After first calling me at the uh, publisher's house where I was working, uh, to say I had too many dirty words in it and we should take some out. And he gave me some examples on the phone and I said, oh, but I want to keep that fuck. <laughs> and, and so, but anyway, so then I cleaned it all up and sent it back to him and then he called up, Norman Pothorids called up and said, you took out too many, we've got to put some back in. <laughs> um, after it came out, when I stopped, at, I stopped at the dry cleaners to pick up my clothes and handed in the ticket for the clothes, my dry cleaner and his wife recognized my name and I started writing again. It took me a few years after the divorce to recover enough of a sense of self to begin writing my first novel, Sick and Full of Burning. I stayed in New York to do this, working in children's books, teaching at a private school for emotionally disturbed kids, and tutoring a teenager. One day, Con Edison turned off my electricity because a very previous tenant had not paid his bill. The representative on the telephone refused to believe that I was not that tenant. Finally, I said I had a sick child. Whether she believed me or not, the representative was required by law, I knew this, to turn the electricity back on after that. I was ashamed of myself, but pleased too, and I figured that if I could holler at Con Ed and get them to do what I wanted, I had learned to be a New Yorker, and my sense of self was back in working order. <clears throat> I grabbed my rough draft of Sick and Full of Burning and went home to Richmond to write on it, what, to, to work on it. While I was there, my mother decided to write a book about moving to England, as she and my father planned to do in retirement. And as it happened, my brother joined us to work on a nonfiction manuscript that, we, that would become on high steel about life as an iron worker. My father took to saying that he was going to write a book called The Old Man and the Sea Scale. I figured I had forfeited five years to being married and then to being divorced and I didn't want to lose more time. I tried to sort out what books I wanted to write. Perhaps I should have thought instead about the business of becoming a writer, sales, agents, networking for freelance pieces, but I concentrated on the books themselves, my subjects, characters, imagery, the forms and structures. I visualized a bookshelf holding the books I wished to write. This time I say visualized because I guess it was something like a vision, although making out the titles on the spines or even just knowing which volume was poetry and which fiction occupied my evenings for some weeks. I have never been rigid about what I would write, but a number of my books derive from that period of thinking about how I would fill the shelf. I also revised the lecture I delivered to myself daily from, you are not a writer, to, if you don't write your books, no one else will. Now that it was clear that I was going to be a writer, whether or no, my mother became as supportive and helpful as any daughter could hope. She read reams of works in progress responded to my compulsively anxious queries about whether to use this word or that, this punctuation or that, told me to keep going when I imagined I should quit, and typed the entire handwritten draft of my autobiographical narrative, The Exiled Heart. She typed it on her old manual, with the keys that had to be hammered half a mile down. I left the draft pages on the dining room table when I went to bed, and when I got up, I found them side by side with the typed pages. Male writers have sometimes relied on the assistance of their wives or daughters. I had my mother, and she was a match for any of them. But one day, this was much later, after my father had died and my mother was failing, she said, 
I wish you'd leave Wisconsin, find a good man, and get married. I had kept writing and published a number of books, but sales were tiny, and big prizes and grants went elsewhere. By then, we both knew I wasn't going to be a literary celebrity, that no grandstand judge was ever going to look my way. And although she didn't want me to quit writing, she did want me to have a happier life. And I do. Burke and I were married September 17, 2000, in the small farmhouse we bought in Southside, Virginia. It's my husband who deserves all the credit here. He makes our country life possible by being good at all the things I haven't a clue how to do. Uh, this morning, someone in here rescued me because I couldn't figure out how to use the, how to get the coffee out of the coffee pot over at the cafeteria. And he said to me, he said, you missed the training course, didn't you? I think I missed the training course for life. We have 44 acres, including an orchard, a woods, a pond, and a vegetable patch. It's because of Burke that I can look out my window, the glasses from 1874, at the small rain falling on loblolly pines. Intermittently, the pianissimo missile strengthens to a hard shower on the tin roof. Part of what makes my life now happy is my knowledge that I've written at least some of the books I plan to write. I do hope to write all of the books on my mental bookshelf. I have had an enduring relationship with writing, with the dream, attainable or not, but the dream is there, of creating something lasting, something memorable, some poem or novel or story that would do what I think art should do, bring beauty and truth together in a way that will help others to know what the late Beethoven string quartets taught me, namely that artists make meaning, and meaning is celebration, triumph, the most miraculous of miracles. Meaning is logos, and without it there never was a beginning, not to anything, not to us, not to the greatest story ever told, and not even to the least. I love when writing I lose track of myself. Myself works free of the constraint of time. It's time that allows us to recognize ourselves as selves, and when we forget ourselves, we live, however briefly, outside of time. We know eternity, if only for a moment. A couple of years ago, Fred Chappell asked me who I think of as my audience. You, I said. He was surprised. I would have thought it was your parents, he said. My parents are sometimes my subjects, with their permission, I might add, but not my audience, even emotionally. The audience I think of myself as writing for is made up of readers I admire, whose serious regard and respect I want to earn. Some are writers, some not. Of course, I was pleased whenever my parents responded positively to something I wrote, but if I had written for that positive response, I would not only not have written certain works, including anything with the word nipple in it, I would not have written at all. This doesn't seem a problem to me. My parents did not play their violins for their parents' applause. They didn't play for their children's applause either. They made music because music was what each of them was born to make. In an unpublished memoir, my mother wrote about the sleeping porch that was the first apartment she and my father rented after they were married. They used to sleep in until the heat of day caught up with them, and lying in bed, they'd hear the milkman setting his bottles on the front steps. My mother was 20, a grad school dropout. My father was 24. My mother was probably already pregnant but she wouldn't have known it yet. I love them, thinking of them like this, young and full of energy and laughter and wildly smitten with each other. I'm glad my mother had that in her life, but she wouldn't have been so devoted to my father had he not, as she put it, had beautiful brown eyes and played the Brahms better than anyone. That was what I learned from them both that what comes first is the devotion to artistic meaning, to truth and beauty. I was always going to be a disciple of art, someone disciplined by art, and it's never not been, for me, a matter of love, a kind of heaven. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I hope, I hope somewhere in there there's a craft lesson. Are there any questions or any more pointed questions about craft, literature, life? No? No questions at all? Okay, let's go have coffee. And now I know how to get coffee out of the little thing. I are, we go way back, uh, although this is the first time that he's aware of it. <laughs> in, the, in the mid and late 70s, uh, I was living in a small Florida town along the, uh, uh, the East Coast, and in that tiny town they had a, a news, a little news store called Chuck's Newsstand, and where you could get uh, papers and magazines some of them, you know, quite late. And oddly enough, they had quite a display of poetry, broadsides, newspapers, even some uh, uh, literary mags. And it was there that I actually got my, my education as far as reading uh, poetry from the uh, 70s. Uh, I remember reading their Norman Doobie and Marvin Bell, Sandra McPherson, and Laura Bad Boats Jensen. And, and I, I remember reading a, a poem by Peter then. I wish I, could, wish I could remember exactly what the poem was. But I said to myself, right there, I'm going to keep my eyes on uh, this Balakian because he's all right. <laughs> and, and, and I'm willing to bet that the poem that I read uh, that day way, way back uh, was included in uh, Peter's uh, first collection, Father Fisheye. And in Father Fisheye, he has a poem called Graham House, April 76, which has uh, the great line, and Nolan Ryan's worth half a million. Now, how was he or anyone else to know that, that now a banjo hitter gets a lot more? <laughs> and the reason I, I mentioned the Graham House Review is that for many years, uh, Peter and Bruce Smith, they were editors uh, of uh, the Graham House Review. I have a copy here. They actually have some downstairs in the poetry section. So take a look at that uh, after you, you bought uh, some of Peter's books and uh, Bruce's. Uh, with all the praise that Peter's gotten for his poetry, and he's gotten quite a bit, uh, from Father Fisheye to his latest, uh, June Tree, New and Selected Poems, the quote I like best is, Balakian's poems are both personal and cosmopolitan. Doesn't that sound great? Wouldn't you? Any writer, really a poet, be cosmopolitan. <laughs> and, uh, and it's really true because he, uh, if, uh, whether Peter is doing uh, work in the lyric or the narrative or combining both, he, can, he encompasses a pretty wide uh,